and then I got to get into you know, our documentation process. Um, so today I just brought those for you uh, just because I didn't think to do it yesterday. So the first one, as you might recall, looks like this. And this was finished in 1982. Um, uh, this one had started in 1968 is when this one started. And then this, well, this is our first document. Then as soon as the, the day after we finally had this printed at Humboldt State, then we started this one. Um, and, uh, and then like I was telling you yesterday, we just got a, a middle range, not a high volume dictionary, not a low, it's just an intermediate dictionary of English and just started flipping through it. And anything that wasn't in here, I tried to include in here, and so I expanded it. So that was my goal here. And so at that point, I was still been able to work with Bernice Humphrey. Um, there was still uh, a couple of speakers left, you know, L1 speakers still living. So we could kind of work on that, um, this portion here. And so that's how this one came in existence. We made 500 copies, we ran out, and for some reason, we made one green and one maroon, but they're the same book. <laughs> I don't know. Well, um, this is the one you have, okay. Um, I know, they're hard to find now because I think we made 500 of these, what? Yeah. Yeah, so this, is, this, so this was all written in the Unifon alphabet, which we discussed yesterday. And then we worked on the concordance. And then, and then in between that was when we were leaving Unifon and coming across, this was the practical alphabet booklet. I don't know if you guys have this one too. Or have you seen this one? Because this is still available in limited. We only made like, huh, yeah, huh? yeah. And then this came out of that. So if you kind of look at the history, it went from here to here to here to here. So as it moved across, we were translating data, you know, from here into here. Well, this was all Unifon. Then we translated into that, and then also on the so uh, the sheet I gave you there for being a language hunter. Um, there's uh, places to find more data. <clears throat> oh, sure. Okay, so, all right. Um, so, yeah, so again, the goal yesterday was to bring us up to speed on how we got to uh, the Talawadani alphabet, and, I, and main, mainly that was probably the core. Oh, um, I gave you this yesterday. It has a mistake on it, and Josh, oh, Josh, Josh, who's Josh? Chahuantne, so if you go to letter 30, 32, oh, it says S. Wait, that one is correct. Which one is it? Oh, is this the correct one? No. Yeah, I got to get the one that wasn't incorrect. Hang on, I'm sorry. Uh, it is 31. So if you go to 31, and, and this says S, strike that out, and it should be a C. So on 31, on your handout, let me get this clearer, made a big mess out of it. On 31, where it says letter S, cross that out, not a dollar sign, and make it a C. Because that's the sound in Unifon. So on 31, yep, yep, exactly. Yeah, so that's, so if you're translating out of these two older dictionaries, that'll help you uh, translate those. Because those words, all the words in here have been put into the modern database, so it's actually done for you, you know, so. But if you want to do that, it's, it's, it, that's how you do it. Okay, all right, cool. So today, um, so I want to move on, uh, you know, leaving where we left off yesterday and start working uh, on, on the grammar portion more directly on language. So again, so I want you to remember that grammar is inherent. How do you spell inherent? Oh my god. I -N -H -E -R -E -N -T. Inherent, right? To the language. I say this is because uh, some people may feel that people are making up language rules. Well, you, 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 you don't have to make up language rules because the language uh, rules are already in the language. It's just a matter of, of teasing them out. Um, and uh, uh, and Hoshi, yeah, sign in. 
And you can borrow one of these books for the day. You probably, sure, you probably have this. I do. Yeah. Okay. And there you go. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Did the uh just none? You can might have helped them if I said, bring your book, right? So grammar is inherent to the language. It doesn't, you know, somebody doesn't sit down at a table and think about rules. And what our job is in grammar is to find out what the rules are, okay? And I showed you a piece of grammar yesterday, which was inalienable possession, right? So inalienable possession. Okay, and that, and I told you that they look like this at the end of words. It's either going to be an e, an e, a glottal stop, maybe a ne, maybe a ne, and then a raised vowel like this. Okay, so when when words have these types of markings on the end of them, they are inalienable. And I gave you some examples. I'll give you a couple more today. So if you take the word money, trut. Drut is money. It's also by the word for dentalia, or our Indian money, the ones you have on right there. So if you take drut, this now is uh, an alienable word, meaning that it, it exists in the world on its own. It doesn't belong to a class or by to anybody. It's just if you walked on the beach and you luck, were lucky enough to find a, a drut, it would be laying there. That's drut, okay? But now once the drut becomes possessed constantly by somebody, it changes to dre te. Okay. So then we have to add to it the e, which is this right here. And then we have to re syllabify it and it looks like this. Dre te. Now this is inalienable money because it's constantly owned by somebody in the universe, okay? And now you can do things like you can add, now you can add words to it. So if I say shh, it means my. So shh, my money, okay? I could say not me, t. Oh, not me, t. That would be white man's money, see? Or I could change it into spunt you, you know, Spanish money, John and so forth. So this is an example of alienable objects, and then now it is inalienable. And the language, for some reason, cares about this. Okay, so it's a part of our language. So this is an example of grammar. And you're just, it exists in the language organically, so you go hunt it down and you try to figure out what, it's, what the rules are. Like I gave you that crazy little sentence yesterday, I seed him fly, I seed him, he flied well, and we all laughed. Well, it was because that's improper grammar. You know, I saw him fly is proper grammar. So you see, that is in the language unconsciously. It's a part of the, of the, of the language itself, in that case, English. So grammar is inherent to the language Dalaha, da noyash. It doesn't, um, uh, our job as linguists and language learners and so forth and grammarians is to, um, is to find those rules, okay? And so that's what I want to share with you today, okay? I was thinking about the possession. Mm -hmm. Because of ignoring, if anybody ignored your possession, it could maybe trigger a fine, right? Because it's ownership of something. Ownership of. Of, of, yeah, of something. Well, see, because in this particular possession, it includes things like the body, right? Remember that from a little bit from yesterday? So body words, it also includes family words. And a small set of other words, like money, okay? So any part of your body, your body can't exist in the universe by itself. You know, the, again, the eyeball can't just be floating around and be a functioning eyeball. It belongs to a thing called the body, so it's inalienable, okay? And we believe, the language believes, that so our family, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, cousin, friend, they are inalienable because they don't just float around the universe, okay? Again, now money did by itself, right? But then we made it inalienable, and now it's, 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 it's ownable, okay? Um, so it's a little different than, like, because we're talking about, like, say, possession of a fishing hole, right, or something, and you, or a boat, and then you come in and you just take off with my boat, or you come fish in my fishing hole without permission, then you violate the law, and then I can come after you for jeish, which is payment. 
So they're, they're related, but, you know, but they're a different concept. And so anyway, so that's an example of grammar. And so what we do is spend time hunting that down. So uh, what I wanted to start with uh, was, um, is a pretty simple um, but very important, uh, very simple but very important uh, thing called syntax. I'll move over here a little bit. So, so syntax. And I used to geekingly tell my students, and this doesn't mean the tax you pay for sinning. <laughs> uh, you know, tax you pay for sinning. Sin tax. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah I, I know it's geeky, but I actually used to say that, and I said it again today. Oh, my God. You know? <laughs> but anyway, yeah. So what syntax simply is, is word order. So throw this guy away. I think he was dying on me yesterday, too. So word order, okay. So let's start kind of looking at word order. So what I'm talking about in word order is how you construct a sentence, how you express a sentence. What are the words of the, what are the order of the words in the sentence? And so in English, if I was, uh, so if I had said, um, I am running, right? Oh, today. Is that a good English sentence? I am running today, right? I mean, it, I mean, it's not ingrammatical. I mean, it's correct, I think. So I am running. And so if now, so to look at the word order means, let's look at the type of words in the sentence. So we start picking them apart, and we end up with this thing called word classes, OK? It means the class of the word, not like you know, first seniors and juniors, not that, or rich or poor. It's the types of words that are, exist in the language. OK, so, so I is what part of speech? It's a pronoun, okay? So that's P-R-N. And running, in this case, is a noun in English, but we think of it as a verb at least. Today is also a noun, and am is a verb. Okay, so this is the verb. So we got a pronoun, we got a verb, we got a noun and a noun, okay? I am running today, okay? And we can also say today I'm running, can't we? We can, we can put this out front if we wanted to, like right there. Today, I am running. Okay, we can put it in either location. All right, so that's a good English sentence. So now if we take this same idea, and let's just do a simple sentence in Dainee. So I am running today. So we have to have, so our word order is S-O-V. S-O-V. Or it's also called verb final. So our sentences typically are verb final, meaning at the, the verb is always at the end of the sentence, okay? So if we know now that every sentence you say, most 98% of them, the verb is always at the end. So let's reorder this how it would be for Dainee, but in both English words. So it would go like this. Today, and then this is, I am running. So here we have a noun, and then how we have a verb. OK, so we have our noun and our verb. So now let's put that in Dainee way out so you can see what it looks like. So di shri nis, di shri nis. Oh, I was going to go capital, so nash. Da. And I'm going to put future on it because it says I am running today. Does that imply to you that it's in the future when I say it? I am running today. Is it happening now or is it run happening in the future? It could, be it could be either. So let's put a parenthesis meaning it could be either way, right? All right. So di shrinis today nashta I am running. Di shrinis nashta te today I will be running. You know, I'm going to be running today at noon, or running in the parade, or whatever, okay? All right, so you can see, so the word order is noun, verb. And so, S-O-V, or verb final, okay? So that's a basic kernel sentence. This is the simplest sentences that we can make are kernel sentences. These are called kernel sentences. And it's a really good way to start seeing how two different languages operate. Because if I go to the store and I say this, I am buying to 
potatoes. I am buying potatoes, right? So I am, or he, let's go to he, is buying jamude. Okay? So he is buying, you know, t uh, tomatoes. Now notice where the buying is. See where the verb is? So here's your verb. Here's your noun. Here's a pronoun again. And here's the, oh, wait, buying. It's a noun. <laughs> but look where the verb is. Look where the pronoun is. So, so my point here already is what? The syntax between Dani, Taladani, and the syntax in English is different. Okay? That's my point right now. Okay? It's just that word order is different. Syntax is different for Talawa than it is for English. And it might be true for Spanish and Chinese and what other languages on the world, in the world, okay? What does SOB stand for? So, and I'll do that for you now. Okay, so there's another way to look at a sentence, and it's called through a semantic view, which is subject, object, verb. Okay, so let's do one. So that's the subject the object, and then the verb, all right? So when you have a transitive verb, which means it requires an object, like to kiss, or to hit, or to kick, that requires an object, so that's a transitive verb. So in a sense like that, if I said in English, the boy is kicking the ball, I'm using these ing forms, kicking a ball. Oh. So, for an SOV, who is the subject of the sentence? Who controls the sentence? The That's right, the boy. So he's the subject, right? He's the one controlling the verbal action, right? So he's subject. And uh, so what is the object in this sentence? The ball, correct. So that's the object. And where's our V? Where's our verb? Is. Is. Very good. Okay. So that's our verb, right? All right. Okay. Now, let's do it in Dane. All right. So, V. Che. Le. Hirsch. Now we need this. Shra was yes tush. Okay. So now the boy. Okay. We chele hirsch shra was yes tush. So now we've got our subject. All right. Here's our subject. Shra was is our object, and yes tush is the verb. So see, we're of SOV in the semantic definition of, of sentences, and we're, that's why it says, or just to say verb final, because usually always our verb is down here at the end, always, okay? It's just something to be aware of, okay? SOV, so we're an SOV language. Um, English uh, is not, okay? Uh, I am going to town. Where's the verb? I'm going to town. It's way at the top, right? To town is at the end. <laughs> um, town to I'm going with, is our order. This sounds horrible in English. Town to I am going, <laughs> right? You go, what kind of English is that? <laughs> See? So again, my point is just to start out with this, this piece is uh, to get to word classes is um, word order is different, okay? So just be cognizant of that, all right? Uh, <clears throat> now, so I, what I have on the uh, outline for you are word classes. So what I, I would like to talk to you about and show, to, show you right now. So the most simple sentence that a person can write in Dane probably is a verb, but, but I won't do that to you right now because it doesn't make sense yet. Okay, so when you do a sentence, you have to have the subject or the noun first, right? So. Um, the 
HS ne nashta. Let's go with that for now. So this says V chis ne nashta. So that means that, so this is to translate the man is running or runs. Let's put it that way. Just put, let's say runs. Kind of get away from that is thing. So V chis ne nashta, the man runs. So you got your, this is, a, this is a kernel sentence now, this is a baby sentence, right? You got your, you got your, ob, you got your, your noun and your verb, and you, they don't get much shorter than that, okay? And so in English, is it the same? The man runs. It's, well, in, in this case, it is the same. But we saw already that's not always the case, right? Okay, but this, for us, we're SOV, all right? So... What, what is this part of the sentence called? At the beginning, if on my list here, I got li listed for you, word classes on still on page one. Article, number, noun, pronoun, adjective, postposition, adverb, and verb. So these are our word classes. It's right here, no, excuse me, on, on, the, on, on the outline. Oh, it actually is probably in the book too, but I provided it for you on the outline, okay? On page one. So, the word the is called an article, okay? So this is an article. This, this, this slot right here is an article. On page one there, um, of the of the handout, of the uh, syllabus. Did I not give you a syllabus? Oh, here yeah, you. okay, yep, yeah, okay. So that's the article, is number one. And then the next thing to come in syntactic order is number, okay? Okay. And then in order, the way the word order goes, because we're going to do the whole full-fledged sentence here. I'm jumping, I'm jumping way out in front of you here now. Noun comes, and or a pronoun. So let's put a slot here. Slash, I mean. So a noun or a pronoun, which is really the same thing in some ways. And then you have an adjective. Okay. And then you're going to have... A postposition. In English, they're called prepositions. In Dane and other languages, they're called postposition because of where they're located. And then we have an adverb. And then we have a verb. Okay? Because what's the verb? Always at the end. Okay? So, now, if we start building off this one by one, so let's just keep the same thing. So, we just named Nasta. So how many men are running? One right now. But let's make it many, okay? Just to well, let's well let me see. We need a noun here, a number. So which number do you want? How many men are running? Three. All right, three. Okay. Okay. So so now we need a number. So oh, I uh, say Tahe. That's three. Tahe. Just ne. Nasta, right? Okay, so now we've got three men are running, or three men run, okay? So I'm just doing them piece by piece. So, and, and I'm cheating a little bit. Because, okay, I'll just put it out here. Na, because there's a way to make a plural verb, by the way, in our language. I haven't gotten there yet. So nasta is one person, nagasta is many of them, okay? This is plural right here. This uh, is plural, all right? So tahe, chesne, nagasta. So we, oh, and now I could say, I could change this to the, what, the three men are running. The tache just ne nasta. So we've wiped out how many? We got rid of this one, we got rid of this one, and we got rid of that one, and we're getting rid of this one this time, okay? So let's, get, let's keep getting rid of them. Okay, now let's get rid of the adjective. So what's the job of an adjective in a sentence? What is its job? It describes the noun somehow, it changes the noun, it makes the noun different, it makes it big, small, red, black, white, tiny, you know, whatever, whatever the adjectives in the world are, mean, mad, it could be all kinds of stuff, right? All right, so, so what do we want our men, how do we want our three men? Short. Short, all right, so here we go. So, the tache just ne. Ah, kli nasta, nagasta, nagasta. So now do we have the tache just ne ta kli nasta, nagasta. Excuse me. All right. So 
Now we've wiped out this one. All right, we're getting close to the end already. Now, a postposition or a preposition. Do you know, can you pull out of your head what a preposition is in English? Like where it's at in the sentence? Uh, it's in the middle, in English usually always. Yeah. And it, what's this job though? What are, what, can anybody think of some examples of a preposition? Like, um, is it bridge? It, in a way it bridges, uh -huh. and it kind of sets up a location. Pre prepositions kind of set up a type of a location. So words like, so this is, this is one way we do it. What, you know, yay unten, watten, ni unten, mean chinten. So on top, the bottom, the side, you know, in front, in back, for example. Those are all prepositions, or we call them postpositions in, in Dainé because of where they're located in the sentence. They're located in different places in English. That's called a preposition, and they neither in a post after position. That's why that's that way. But so where do we want to make these men? Uh, so in this language, and I'll give you, just do this one. Okay, so the So now I got rid of that, okay? All right, this means along there, right? So now we got so sentence is growing. So now we have the three men that are short along there. They're running along the river, along the road, uh, along the street, you know, along wherever. Okay. So that's, do you recognize this hawant at all? Hawantquit. There you go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right. So the tahe just ne tahe hawant nagasta. Now we have one last word at least for here to put in here and it's an adverb. So what does an adverb do? What's this job? The, verb. the verbal action is, is changed somehow. Described, it's augmented, it's made different. So, what do we want to do to these three men? So, we. Tahe Jesne Tahe Hawan. What kind of running are they doing? Huh? Fast. Okay. Very good. Now we have, we've used up every slot available in word classes for Talwadini Weya. Okay? Alright, so, So there are three short men running along there quickly, right, in English. So there are three. Short men running. Is it along there quickly or quickly along there? Running quickly along there or along there quickly? Which would you like better? You have a choice. Okay, what do you like? Okay, there are three short men running along there quickly. Look at that complex sentence that you just finished. There are three short men running along there quickly. That's the English syntax, which is known as free English. This is Talwadaini syntax known as free Talwadaini. When it's in free form, it means legal, like the actual form of the language. And look at the word order differences. Let's, let's pick this one apart for word order. Because let's do these first. Okay, so we have an article, right? Well, we have an article. We have a number, we have a noun, we have an adjective, we have a, post a preposition, we have an adverb, and we have a verb. Okay, over here, let's see, where is our noun? We have a noun here. What's along there? That's the post preposition. Quickly is the adverb. Short is the adjective. 
there are three is the number. There are. Hmm, what is there are? Oh, that's the verb. And then there is what? Is that another preposition? It is another postposition. There are. No, there are. I'm, hmm, what part of speech is there? Well, there are three. Oh, they're at. Yeah, they're at are three, right? So I think, it's, I think we'll call it a preposition for today. Oh, and running is what? A noun. Okay. So look at the word order difference. <laughs> Strikingly different, right? So the whole point of this piece of my presentation to you and sharing with you is that our word order is very different. And, just, and our language is interestingly consistent that the verb typically always comes at the end almost all the time. The only time that we're seeing, even from older speakers, from the recordings we have, they'll throw a noun here at the end, like say, the man, or the coyote, or the girl. If they're saying, like we're telling something, three girls were running along there, and then they ran up on a big rock, and one fell off, and the other went down and helped her, and then they ran to the beach and soaked her foot in the water, and then, you know, and then, and then she got up and she was okay, and then they decided to leave, and then she fell down again, that girl because you get lost in where the girl is. So every once in a while, you'll have to throw the, ob the, 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 the subject back on the end to clarify who the heck you're talking about. Okay, so that does happen too in Dany. You know, because the sentence gets, you know, you lose track of who the heck you're talking about. The girl, you know, not, not her girlfriend, but the girl, you know. So anyway, so... We restructure it so that the girl falls in line like it's supposed to do. So sure, sure, you could say... He, then you could say, yeah. Then you, yes, if you, if you weren't just talking along rapidly and you just kind of said, that girl who had fallen down, comma, right in English, is, is wherever she is, she's okay now or something like that. Yes. But it's just used to, to throw information back into the conversation so you know who you're talking about. Um, so anyway, so this is, and so these are our word classes, meaning, so these are classes of words in the language. And um, so here's your kernel sentence a noun and a verb, verb final, and this whole construction is verb final, and then there's your English syntax, which is completely different, okay? So, um, one thing I liked about learning new languages and other languages besides English is, uh, do you remember in grade school, th did you hate grammar? I hated grammar. It was like, it was so frustrating to me, I didn't get it, you know? And then when I started comparing, you know, English to Tolo or English to another language, I go, oh, it's the noun, it's the subject, it's the object, it's in preposition, it's that, you know, all that stuff made sense then all of a sudden, because I had another reference, I suppose, to, to draw from. So these are our word classes, uh, you know, again, the types of words that we have in our sentence. You know, like when you're learning Dainí, you're going to do this. You're going to say, the blue bird is flying. You're going to say, the blue bird. You're not going to think to say, you know, the bird that's blue is flying. You're going to say the bird, the blue bird is flying just because that's how we do it in English. And you will get that over time. That's, that's nothing to, you know, never beat your, when you're learning something new, never beat yourself up ever. Okay. If I can share anything, share that because you're learning something new. Okay. And you'll get there over time. And by, and by use, by use is the best way to try to get that. But if you're going to try to, you know, if you, when you do start composing sentences and so forth uh, on your own or whatever, you know, these are things to keep in your mind. And this is spoken to, by the way, in the, the book you have back in the back. Um, so let's take a look at what page that might be on. I guess I didn't put it there with mine on the outline. Uh, so if you go to page 108 in your booklet, Take, go, to, go to page 108, and then you'll see what I, so you can see here, it says word order, right here. And it's, oh, man, the man is running, by golly, look at that, and so on, all right, all right. Now, so, any questions about word order? Uh, who can recapitulate back to me what word order is, just period, just in a sense, just uh, your own words, please, somebody. What is Syntax. Of a, a sentence and how to form a, a proper sentence and yes, it's all it is. I mean, that, you know, it's simple. It's what it is. Word order, okay? And it's not again what you are paying. All right, okay. So there they go. All right. Now, um, oh, I call. Oh, ah, I left quantifier out. Ho 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 ho. Right here. There's a place for a thing called a quantifier versus a number. 
quanti right here. So after the noun is quantifier, but a quantifier is different than a number, because a number is actually a number. One, two, three, four, five, that's a number. But it, what would be a quantifier? What gives you mass? Large? Uh, that's an adjective. Oh, yeah. That's an adjective, but yeah, you're, in the right, you're right in the right vein. You're in the right vein. Um, things that make you think of object numbers. So, a, okay, okay, that's a noun, but you're on the right, you're, yeah, yeah, yes, you're in the right, you're in the right area of the thinking. Yep, that's right. I'm just, to, so to, something that is quantifiable usually has a number of things associated with it, right? Like, it could be 10, or it could be, you know. So it's words like a few, okay? A few men were running along there. Um, what's some of the other good quantifiers? Um, some, some. See, some's not a number, but you know it's not all of it, right? All of it. Give me all of it. So those are kind of like adjectival-like, but they're also they're quantifying something a little differently. Um, you know, so many, many, a uh, few, uh, a dabble. Give me just a, a dollop of cream cheese or uh, sour cream. Give me just give me a dollop of it. So they're, they're, they're kind of a different type of, they're giving you a quantity, but they're, or some, but they're not giving you an actual number. And they fit after the noun. So if I just said, so, so um, if we were going to interject it since I blew it here and put it right here, let's put ta, which means some. Uh, I don't know if we can put it in this sentence. Let me see. ta just ne ta e. Yes, ta. Some of them along there are running fast. <laughs> Maybe one, the other guy's kind of slow. <laughs> so, oh, wrong place. Wait, no, that's right. It's got to be. Oh, if there's not, if there, if there's no adjective, it's going to follow the noun. But if it is, if there is an adjective, it's got to follow the adjective. See, because this now becomes one unit. See, this whole thing is one unit. Yeah, versus just man. But if this wasn't here, then that would be right here, right? Because, because this now belongs to this. Okay, yeah. All right. Word order in syntax. Very simple, very straightforward, um, and yet uniquely different. Okay? All right. So that's word classes. Um, I, I have a thing here. It's conjunctions and interjections, too. Conjunctions, um, let me see. Do I cover clauses later? I kind of don't. Okay. So in English, we, we, we conjoin sentences with things like and. But, you know, he's a good runner, but he's um, mean. I don't know. Try to pick, mix something up. So, th so you conjoin two sentences. You have a sentence, and then you have a, a, another sentence underneath of it, right? Our language doesn't like to do that. It just likes to say, he's a good runner, period. He's also mean, or he's just mean. You know, it doesn't like to go, he's a good runner, but, you know, he's, he's mean. It just, it just simply just say, he's a good runner, he's mean. <laughs> so really, that's how our language operates most of the time. We don't have a lot of the conjunctions. There's a few ways to get there. I mean, it's not that they don't exist, but they're more rare than you just say straight, straight out what you're thinking. You know, you don't uh, have, therefore, we don't have a lot of run on sentences. You know, because we can get run on sentences in English really easy, you know. Uh, we just keep piling them on, piling them on with like, you know, but and still and if and, you know, or all well, those kinds of things, right? You know, um, it's, it's going to be a nice day if it doesn't rain. Or, hu chan te, do not yash te. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a nice day if it doesn't rain. You know what I mean? So it just makes two sentences. So that's why I put there, because we're talking about sentences, and I just kind of realize that conjunctions. And I do have a little piece in there on conjunctions in the book. I think it's right next to there. And, and I gave you some examples on how to make conjunctions. Okay. So is a conjunction used to create like a compound sentence? Mm-hmm. A subordinate clause, you know, relative clause. You know, here's the main sentence or clause, and then this is, you know, like I say, he's a good runner, but he's mean. But he uses stairways. Yeah, but he uses the stairway. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, yeah, but you're, you're, you're creating two sentences and knitting them actually together. Yeah, and English loves to do that. Dany does not. It just doesn't, it just would rather just say it, <laughs> just straight out. Um, 
So if you, I think it's on page, let me find this for us. Um, I did. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and then how to interpret them for the law, right? Okay, so. Hmm. I thought I had a thing in here on it. I do somewhere. Okay. Uh, Duty. I think there's in here somewhere about 111. Okay, yeah. Okay, so, um, all right. Oh, conjunctions. My God, thank you. I could keep looking past it. So, the bread and butter is good. See, so how, in our language, we don't use the and at all. We just say two nouns together. See, so, but, but, bread and butter is good. We just say, bashuk, noun. Muskwechet, yes, noun. Shum, it's good. Bread, butter, good. There's no need for an and there, okay? And the next one, so, or, bread and butter is good. Bashuk, like, what? Muskwechet, yes, he, chu, shum. Is, and this is almost like a contrived construction. This is not a really good construction in Dani, but it's possible because he too can mean like also or is too, right? And the next one, or two nouns and a suffix. Oh, okay. So you got ba shuk, the noun, muskwechet ish, chu, also, shum. So that's, that's really more customary right there. So ba shuk, the bread, muskwechet ish, chu, also the butter, shum is good. So, um, yeah, that went down at the bottom, um, or uh, with conjunction atti, hui na gitte sa gitshri, atti hui nutte du sa gitshri. All of us were done, still all of you were not. So that's kind of a, of a, a reduced, I mean, a, 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 you know, two sentences knit together. But usually we just put a period at the end. We are done, period. You guys aren't, period. <laughs> pretty, you know, it's pretty straightforward, okay, that way. All right. So those are word classes and a little bit about that. And we're, oh, syntax. Okay, we get, did that. All right. So now comes the fun, fun part. Oh, it's all fun. But so any questions about this or any other thoughts or clarity that's needed or? Mm -hmm. When it says bread, butter, good, mm -hmm. how do we know? Bread butter. Or butter bread, you're or saying. Butter bread. I mean, like, it doesn't, it just says bread so, butter. So, How do you know there's two items as opposed to one? Right. So, that's a, it, it doesn't, the language grammatically doesn't really tell us. It's really context. So, if I was, you know, with your eating and I go, man, this butter bread, <clears throat> right, then that would be muskwe chetish bashuk, the butter bread. See? Because you're putting, uh, you know, the adjective. In that case, butter is an adjective. See? See, right? You know? Or you could say, yeah. So, so is that my English kicking in saying, if I said bashuk, bread, muskwechet yesh, shum, right? So bread, butter is good versus muskwechet yesh, butter, bashuk, bread, shum. It sounds like to me that would mean butter bread, like some kind of really buttery recipe, you know, rich in butter. So it'd be buttery bread, you know, is good. But there really is nothing to tell us but context. Mm -hmm. You know, so if we were sitting down eating together and we were eating the same bread, and we had, man, this butter bread is good versus butter and bread are good, you see. And that's where the chu works really well because you say ba shuk, the bread, butter also chu. Shum. Then you know that it's bread, butter, and are also are good. So that chu it really helps out a lot. Yeah. How's that yeah. chu spelled? C-H-U. It's, it's, it's in sample number, um, where is it at, chu? It's, okay, it's, it's the, it's the uh, uh, right on the same category on page 11, and it says, or two nouns with a suffix chu. See, bread and butter are good. Ba shuk, chat is chu. Shum, see. Then you know it's two objects. If that chew wasn't there, back to you. Is it butter bread, <laughs> or is it bread butter? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's not a lot of clue there for us. Okay, grammatically that is. All right. So we went over S O V already, and now we're going to go on to the verb. And so while I have this sentence right here, 
in the same simple beginning sentence. I'll show you something about our verbs to start with, just kind of as a comparison. <coughs> we have a verb that is internally inflected. We have a verb in Talawadini that is internally inflected. What did he just say? And why does he talk like that? <laughs> but our verbs are changed internally, not externally. Okay? So if I ch said, I am running, so in English, I am, I, I, well, let's, put, let's just make it I run. I run. Okay. So what is I here in this sentence? I run. Do you run? Okay, I run. So what is that? What part of that, of those word classes was it? Is it an adjective? Is it a, oh, yeah. it's a pronoun, exactly, right? It's a PRN, PRN, and our word run is a verb, right? Okay, so let's go on with this. So you run, he runs, And we have the same thing. We have pronoun, pronoun, and verb, and verb, right? And English grammar requires, for some reason, to put an S on there. Because you don't get the way of saying she run, he run, it run. You've you got to put an S on it. <laughs> it makes it somehow progressive or something. I'm not quite sure. Okay. All right. So what's happening is you keep your same verb, right? And you change the pronouns, right? Because what else can we put out here? We can put all kinds of stuff out there, right? We run. They run, right? So the verb, the verb run, it stays pretty much the same. It might get an S on it or not. And then you just change your pronoun, okay? So this is externally happening to the verb, externally, externally, okay? But in Dainí, it happens internally, okay? And so that's called to inflect. You take a verb and you inflect it with change. Inflect. Like I always joke with my students, one of my crazy jokes, you infect the verb with a, with a pronoun, therefore you inflect it. And they go, you're so, yeah, yeah, I agree, I am. Very weird. Okay, so now, now because we inflect internally, so let's look at the word nafta. So here we have na da. Because I have to pull it apart because I'm going to put the pronoun on the inside. I'm not going to put it on the outside. Okay? Here it's out here. All right? Now I could, I could say n not legal talawa, and I could say this, I suppose. I could say this, and somebody would, you know, slightly giggle at you and say, he's trying. Okay, so now I could say she, which means me, she nafta, right? But that would be like, you're definitely a beginner, <laughs> you know. But at least you got the sentence order right. You got the pronoun, you got the verb, and you got the right words together. But guess what? You get to put it like this. So she means me or I. So you go right here. Now that means I run. Nashta. Okay, it's right there. So it goes on the, so inflect the verb internally, not externally like you do in English, like we do in English, okay? So the pronoun for you is, so again, our not so correct Dainí sentence over here. Okay, nan nafta. So what does it really look like, though? Oh, sorry about that. So we borrow the n. Nan You run. So that is actually the shortest sentence in Dainí. Because I run. Is that a sentence in English? I run. Do you run? So I can say, Nashta, I run. Nashta, huh? Do you run? So this actually is a complete sentence because it's got your subject and it's got your verb in, put in one place. See, that's a little different. See, our language works a little different. And then, and, and so in this one here, he runs, it's just Nashta because there is no pronoun for third singular for him, her, or it. It's a zero. So it's just nafta. So that's the base word, nafta. 
and then you expand them from there, okay? So now let me slow down here and lose order what I want to talk to you about here. Okay, so I had staff, Pio pulled this out, dusted the moths off of it. <laughs> Actually, he's been using it too, so it's not covered with moths. <coughs> Something today? You're so busy being the Mathmaut in Yatrine. Or Yatchutne, I should say. Dawa. Okay. You might have seen this before. Okay, so what I'm showing you here is a very scary looking thing. Okay. And but I want it not to be scary, okay? <laughs> Please don't let it be scary. Okay. So our verb can get pulled further and further apart depending on how much information you want to put in it. But one of the things you certainly must put in it is it has to have a verb root. Okay? So let me erase, well, let me see, I'll go over here. Get rid of these bad sentences over here. Okay, so what I'm showing you on this little chart here is, are the slots. So if you look at the side that has 1 through 16 on it sideways like this, so turn it over and look at this. What this is showing us is we can take a verb and we can pull it further and further apart and we can st keep shoving information in it. And that sentence, the verb becomes more and more of a sentence the more we go. Okay? So let's, let's see. Is Nasta a good one to work with for us today since we're already working with Nasta? I suppose so. All right. So we have to have a verb root to start with. All of our languages, all of our verbs have a verb root. And the verb root is filled with a thing called semantic information. This here has semantic value, okay? And when, when we say it means semantic, it, it realizes something in your mind. If I say ta, run. If I say ta, fly. If I say Thumbs, kiss. If I say treat, kill. If I say touch, kick. So it has semantic meaning in reality. Okay, and so that's what makes you think of what you're talking about. If I say ah, is to talk in that slot. Okay, um, it, it, and how many verb roots do we think we have that you've isolated? About 400 verb roots, because you have to think there's verbal actions for to wash, cook, slice, garden, uh, drink, pass away. I mean, every verb that you can think of, cry, you know what I mean? So there's, so there's, so there's a verb root for all of those, just like they are you know, in other languages. So a verb has to start with a root, okay? And then the, the, the most minimal thing it can have, hmm... The most minimal thing it has to have out here, because there's now there's, this is slot six, slot what one? <coughs> slot one, right? Zero, and it's zero because it's the beginning source of the of the verb. Okay, and then we're going to go that way with it. Okay, because you can start adding other information in here. So if I add in person, when you say person, it's talking about the pronoun. So I, us, we. You, they, that's person, okay? So I can put first person in here. I can put second person in here, third person, right? I can put us, per, all of us, person in here, okay? And then out here in front, I can have a thematic prefix that tells you the type of movement it is, okay? Um, so this is very abstract, but, but at the same time, this chart helps explain it to us, okay? So you have the semantic meaning in your verb. So in this case, I'm going to pick with the sta part. This means to run. Okay, sta, sta. So anytime you get a sta verb, you know it has to do something to do with running. Okay. All right. Now over here, I'm going to put a, th a thematic prefix. Um, where's my chart? Okay. I want to put it. Hmm. Well, where is it? Okay, uh, ad, uh, wait. adverbial or locative. There it is. Do. Okay, so number 10, slot 10. So I'm going to put na just for now. I'm going to put it over here. Okay, so we got, what's our, what's our verb right now? 
nafta, right? Nafta. But what's happening is reslavification. We got na. Looks like this on the surface. Underlying it's this nafta. Okay. But when it, when you say it, it reslavifies to nafta. Okay, and it separates these two. Okay. So that's a verb right there, nafta. Now we can inflect this verb for person and go back over examples over here. And I can throw in sh right here. I can put in na here or have a zero, right? So nashta, nanta, and nafta. Okay, there's your first person, second person, and third person. The first person is me, second person is you, third person is him, her, him, her, or it. Okay, the dog runs, it runs, the man runs, the woman runs, she runs, okay? All right, so there, that's how these verb slots, but they're what it's showing you here in this very abstract chart. Now, um, I said over here, na gasta earlier, so this also is the same slot you would put the gosh maybe in here, see? So there's a ga, so ignore this, na rasta, they are running, okay? All right, so all of this behavior, all this change, all this inflecting happens from the beginning of the verb to the end, not on the outside. <laughs> Very different than the way English operates, okay? I just kind of want to share that point over and over, get you thinking about this. This is how this, this, is how this language operates, okay? All right. Um, there's a slot here, slot number 11. It's called the adverbial slash locative. These are sweet because, okay, I'll just say them for you. I'll read them down with me. I'll just go, wa, ya, da, gue, tre, se, te, ye, cha, tle, cha, ta, e. Not sure about, yeah, what's okay. Tse, ge, sa, de. All of those as well have semantic meaning. All of those tell you some kind of a direction. So, if I say da, it means into. So the verb da noyash, come in. So let's do that one. So it's da Oh. Oh yeah. Da, na, oh shoot, I'm in the wrong slot. Da, na. So this is the other version of N. These are the same. You, so da, na, yash. In here, uh, movingly, you come. So that means come in or welcome. Da, na, yash. Okay? And we can inflect that for person. So da da ne shesh, I'm going to come in. Da no yash, da nash, he's coming in. Eat wrong, hey, da nash. So I can go da nash. So that's the shortest form of the verb, da nash. Okay? And then da no yash, you come in. Da ne shesh, I come in. Okay? But anyway, that's the point I'm just trying to share here in this verb chart that you have a chart of, and I'm just showing you how it would appear, and, uh, and you can change that. Now, if I, by theory, if I said go out, I should be able to say ta, change this to ta, because ta means outward. Ta yash. So da la ta yash, where are you going? Ta, you're going away, see? So da is in, ta is out, okay? Gue, going over. Se, going down, or uh, uh, coming up on the shore, tre, downward, and so on. So this is really cool, because then you can start changing the part of the verb to the direction you want this to happen. So if I'm running right now, flat on the ground, nashta, but if I want to be running down the hill, I put treshta here. Ignore that. So treshta, I'm running down, okay? Ya shta. I'm running through the boulders or running through the forest, okay? Um, pick a couple more here. Um, um, se. Se shta. I'm running up the hill. <laughs> up the hill. <laughs> you know, so these are really cool because they again have semantic meaning. They're alive, they're well, and they have meaning. So that slot is very powerful because it helps you change, inflect, inflect your verb to make it do different things. And what a, an amazing amount of information 
get stuck in a verb or put into a verb in our language. And this is why we're called a verbal language. Because 99% of our words are verbs. English, 99% of our are nouns. English is a noun language. We are a verb language. Because it likes to keep the verb separate and then just change with all of its <coughs> nouns and pronouns. We like to take all the information and stick it inside the verb. Okay? It's the way the language works. You know? We also have a thing in here now called tense. Right? What is tense? So what are the three tenses? Past, present, and future. Exactly. That's correct. And, and so if I want to say I ran, or he ran, so where's our nasta? Let's go back and find our nasta that we, I wiped out here. Okay, so here's nasta. And the, the perfective slot is where? It's in slot five, so it's over here somewhere. So if I say this, nasta, now he ran, okay? Na sinta, you ran. Na susta, I ran. Okay, and then it's, and it's in the past now. See, all that information is inside the verb. So what are we doing to the verb? We're inflecting the verb. We're changing it. We're altering it with all this data. Okay? So again, I am sharing with you this very abstract piece of our language. And when you speak the language, you don't sit there and think of it that way. You go, she nasta, nanchu nasinta, he nasta. You're not sitting there you know, trying to piece this all together. The purpose of this is to show you how our, the structure of our verb, okay? That's the purpose of this, to get you to understand what it looks like and that there's these slots, they're called verb slots, and what's available to put inside of it to change how it happens. There's one called the reversive. Um, if I can find it on here. Is the reversive on here somewhere? The mm, mm. There should be one on here called the reversive. By putting the sound mm in the middle of a word in a certain place, it means you do it again or you, or you, you return from that p p place, like, um, or to, to, to repeat the process. There's one here called the conative, which is ooh. And it means like you're attempting something, but you ne you're not sure if you're going to complete it or not, but you're trying to get it done. And that's why it's in the verb, like to buy something, you height. Because when you go to a store or a, or a car dealership, you might have to negotiate for a while, and you may not end up buying it. So it's an attemptual, <coughs> possibly completive, possibly a non-completive action. That's called the conative and so on. So all this information is available in the verb. And if I have just shared with you anything for, through this piece of the presentation, I just want you to realize how our verb operates. And you don't need to memorize all this stuff. I mean, you know, you, you know what I mean, to, to, to speak the language. I just want you to be aware that this is how it looks. You know, if you, if you took my body all apart and all I, all I had was my skeleton up here, you know what I mean, versus what I look like in, you know, now, that's what this is. This is the skeletal structure of our verb, okay? And that verb is located in the sentence where? At the end, okay? And, so, and at the very end of the verb is the real meaning, right? Then you're like, sta right, means run, right? And so forth. So yash means go, all right? These two mean go. Um, and there's how many again, do you think, chakwantne, off the top of your head? Four, about 400, right? Like, you know, so let's write a few up here. So drink, I mean, you, yes, drink, he's killing it. Ash drink, I'm killing it. Uh, Sheen drink, he's killing, shush drink, he's killing me, you know? We can make it come back and forth, too. Um, um, es is to cook. So, yes, des, he's cooking. Bar shuk, yes, des, cooking bread. Um, des, I'm cooking bread. Nun, int des, you're cooking bread. So, all these carry your semantic meaning um, uh, to, to you and what it means. Um, and, and so, what, what I really enjoy, too, is that a verb, when it's fully filled out, is a sentence because it has the subject and it can, you have to have the object. And then it has the verb at the end, so it's verb final. Even the verb is verb final, which is verb final in the sentence. <laughs> so you see what I'm saying? So upon, upon, twice, the verbal meaning is at the end. Always. Yep, in the verb itself and in the sentence. See, it's in both locations. Yeah, exactly. So there you go. All right, so that's a quick kind of overview of a verb slot in our verbs. And, and you'll never find a verb that has, uses all 16 slots. 
just be aware of that. You're not going to be able to find a Taladini word that has all 16 of these filled up. Yeah. No, because there's too many possibilities. You know, and you might get you might get you know one that has almost all of them, some that has only two of them, some that has eight of them, some that has maybe seven of them or something like that. But they just show you where they fall in this abstract framework. But you're not going to find a verb using every single one of those information in that verb structure. It's not going to happen. It's just because we, we've tried. <laughs> it's like there's way too much. I mean, and then the coolest thing too is now. So this is without the s. Nasta is present tense. He runs. He's run. He runs. Right. Nasta. He ran. Right. Now, how is he going to run? Simple. We're just going to add out here at the end te, because we got to get rid of this. So it's going to be nas. Da te. He will run. And so you just take any verb in the world, throw te on the end of it, and you've got your future. Okay? Where the past tense has to be marked in the center of the verb, and it's either going to be an S in some verbs, it's going to be a GH in some verbs, and it's going to be an N in other verbs. This is the most productive meaning, the mostly used is the S perfective, the, the S past tense. This is the next number, which is pretty low, and this is the most rare, is the GH perfective. Perfective means it's done with, it's in a perfect state, it's over with, it. so it means past tense, perfective. So, and again, you don't have to memorize this because you're going to learn the word itself, and you don't have to, you know, go, now is this an S perfective verb, a G perfective verb, or an N perfective, no. That you just learn in the word, but just be aware there are three of them, okay? But this is the most used in all the verbs. Biggest, biggest chunk of them is the S, perfective. So that's our verb slot. What a beautiful little animal it is. Linguists love this stuff. That's why they study our language. They love this. Most languages in the world aren't like this. So when they find a language like this, they're like amazed by it. You know, because if you can learn one English word, run, and, and then all the pronouns, you can make a lot of sentences, <laughs> right? But in our language, you have to learn all of these conjugations, 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 you know, if you're learning from the outside, coming in, and they're coming analytical and tear it all apart and everything. Well, we, we have to learn it by hearing it and using it. So it's a completely different approach, right? So, but this helps us understand. Any questions? Yes, questions, yes. One of the criticisms of English is uh, being heavily some huge number, I forget what yeah, it is. is the, the, the argument that they, they're, they're emphatic that way to try to get closure, to close up, maybe to close up discussion. Maybe your Tala was infinitely open to discussion because of the verb thing. Because of the verb. Promoting discussion more active or something. Right, because you can make a verb like more continuative happening by the way you would inflect it too, by adding more information, like that ooh. That ooh in there kind of tells you that it's maybe not going to be completed. You know what I mean? It's possible, you know. Um, uh, and, then, and then, yeah, so, so now English is so, and, and we, when we started first originally translating from English to Talua, we were trying to find, we were coming at it from an English perspective because we all spoke English, right? So, so we're thinking of it in an English way, and we were trying to just pound the heck out of our language for all these nouns, and it, it doesn't really care about nouns the same way English does. It's very interesting, too. It's just, I mean, you know, uh, and we'll talk about that uh, by, uh, hopefully by the end and how we create nouns today for the modern world that we live in. You know, I want to cover that with you as well. Yeah, so noun, ver noun language, English, verb language, Talawa. Okay, it loves to move. Our language loves action. It likes creating imagery in your mind, you know, like, say, let's take the bat, you're playing baseball. Must, I'm going to pull it all apart, must, yacht, tsut. So, the semantic meaning of tsut is to hit or to strike something, smack, okay? Ya means through the atmosphere, like through the sky, through this room. So this is like through. And then must means it's an instrument, like a tool, like a knife could be, or a bat, or something like this. So this is called instrument. And then sat is it with it, so it's caused to happen. 
and then it's done by an unknown doer, which is called the passive. So this is the passive. So what this is painting in your mind is you've got something in your hand, muff, and it's going through the atmosphere, being done by somebody, caused it to hit. So that's a bat. So our, our noun is very descriptive. It gives you a complete picture of what the heck it's doing. Must ya tsut. Okay, because your goal is to smack that ball, right? So here, for, for just for a, a, a baseball bat, you're getting this beautiful word. And you can almost pick apart almost all of our nouns like this. Um, and we'll get into nominalization at some point too. But so, so see how this is a really a verb? So you got your verb root, you got your causative, you've got your adverbial, and then you added an instrumental muscle out here. So this is actually part is the verb part, and this is what makes it a noun. Oh, plus the passive, that's a help, that helps get it to the, the, the noun position in the language. Otherwise, you see it, it's really a verb. <laughs> uh, one of, one of, uh, word for crane, there's two of them. Uh, ta muenjo. Des Go mind, what's an awful long word for a crane? But what you're not getting out of this sentence for crane, uh, so des tesh, so this means to stand on two feet. This means at a location there by there. Moiten at the edge. Ta the water. So what, when you see a crane standing at the edge of the water, looking for fish, right? So ta tesh. So that's the word for crane. Or one of the, there's another word, which is chu uh, et ni or ne. Get means to peck, like this motion. So that's like to peck or chop if you're chopping wood. Ni is a noun maker, so that's er. And chu is that conative that he's attempting, and cha means he does it over and over again, habituatively. So this is habituatively, okay? So you're, take, so the, this is a verb that's got a nominalizer, the, like run er, see er, do er, right there, the knee. So this is actually part of the verb that he is continually attempting this because he's trying to catch fish, right? Or frogs out of the field. And knee, the one who does that. So our, 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 the nouns we do have, which are plenty, actually paint a picture for you. Because if I ask you, close your eyes and say tree, you know, what do you see? <coughs> well, your version of tree, right? But I could be looking at a birch with no leaves on it. <laughs> you know, you could be seeing a redwood tree, <laughs> you know. But there's nothing that tells you, you know, it's got limbs or it's got needles or it's got cones or it's, you know, stands upright or lay sideways. There's no, that's, so that's the much, how much different English is, for example, than it is in our language. Our language is very, very descriptive. It's verbally descriptive. Almost every noun is like that. Um, we have a few nouns that um, have been around for so, so long that they're monosyllabic, means they're only just one syllable, like, like the word want, which is fire. It's so short, I mean, where do you start picking it apart, you know what I mean? Like, it just means fire, you know? And then you can, it gets incorporated like, ya, teeth, want. This is sparks flying out of your chimney. Through there, we already had ya earlier, t in an emphatic way is being caused to fire, <laughs> to be fire. So it's shooting sparks out into the, into the atmosphere. So this is sparks. So now it got incorporated back into this noun, but you can't pick it apart. It's too darn old. It's, and we find huntin all over this map. Like I was telling you yesterday, you find huant or kon in every the Ne language almost across North America. Huant, the word fire. Yeah, it's so old in the language that every, almost every language in North America has it in it. It's either some form of it. Yeah. Belt, it's, no, it's, no, 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 no. It's like, it has different shapes like, like, uh, let me see, no, let me see. Something like this. Huant or 
uh, there's I, I don't off the top of my head, but they but 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 then they, but, uh, they're all the same underlyingly. So it just tells you it's an old word. We're like bat, maybe a new word, or relatively. It could be only be a thousand years old, or maybe it's only thirty years old, or maybe it's you know what I mean, because that was composed from the grammar. This is just a base word in the language, just like the word hand, la. A done place, right? Yeah. Look at the duns on here. Oh my gosh, there's duns all over here. You know, you got to toot dun, you got, uh, you know, suit to na to na. You know, you, you know, you got. Look at that map. There's dun all over the darn place. What that means at that location, at that village, at that place. So it's all over North America. So when we were all at that same fire in the beginning, that word was already in our language. And then as we spread across North America, it traveled with us. Uh, like I was saying yesterday, like, like, like ta or tu, either one of those means water. Oh, ta, <laughs> so you're going to find ta all over, or tu, or both of them, you know, meaning to do with water or liquid, you know. So anyway, so yeah, nouns are uh, fun because they really started from verbs, and then they get made into a noun through grammar, or the grammar of our language. Okay. All right, um, so verbs are a blast. Verbs tell us all kinds of stuff. And now I want to move on to uh, pronouns, OK? And we covered a whole bunch of them today already, all right? And there's two types of pronouns. Any questions I, just as we're going on? This is, I'm, this is a ton of stuff, and it's abstract, and, but that's what grammar is. But it helps us understand how the structure of our language, the skeleton, the internal muscles of our, of our language. That's what grammar does for us. So pronouns. So a noun. What's a noun? Yep. Person, place, thing, or an idea. OK? Person, place, thing, or an idea. All right. God is good. Running is great. Love is the greatest. Okay, so there's your idea. Okay, or whatever. <laughs> right. So it's a person. It's a place. San Francisco, a man, a thing, a rock. Okay. So that's a noun. Right. And so, and so, compared to that, what's a pronoun then? Mm, describes a noun. Do, that's an adjective. Correct. Yeah, who said that? Yes, it replaces the noun. That's why it has the same slot in the sentence, in the SOV, because it's either the full noun, the man or he, all right? Woman or she, right? So this replaces the noun. That's why it's called pronoun. <laughs> it's similar, some, something like pronoun, kind of like. So you get a full noun and a pronoun. So on, I put on that page there for us. So if we were to look at page um, 100 and 101 in your booklet, you will find some pronouns. Okay, And that list are all independent pronouns. Okay, They are stand alone in the language all by themselves. Okay, they're independent pronouns. Yuti kai. Yuti is a noun and yuti kai is a pronoun. Okay. And so let's just take a look at a few of them. We've got a few individuals. We've got who, four of us, those people, many, us, you two, good one, five of them, everything, everything there is in the whole universe. All of you, everybody, them. Okay. So these, these pronouns stand alone in the language, just on their own. They're, they're a separate word, and that's why they're called independent. So we have independent, pron uh, independent pronouns. Independent. A-N-T? A-N-T. Dent. Pronouns. And we have also dependent pronouns and that's the other one we're going to spend time talking about today as well dependent 
Okay, so we know a noun replaces, I mean, a pronoun replaces a noun. Okay, so um, when I say she, that means me or I, right? So that's just an independent pronoun. She, me, means I, none, you, he, him, her, it, okay? So those are independent pronouns. She, she jamute nashtas. I like potatoes. None sluk non tas, huh? You like salmon? He uh, apes. Young, he eats apples. <laughs> okay, so those are straightforward, and uh, and they do operate just like they do in English. They they just stand alone in language. Okay, and you can learn as many of those as you want to learn and know. Okay, um, it's, if you know how to count in Dini, the four of them. So la na he ta he dunchi. So dinchne has four. Three of them la na he ta he. So what is what is three of them? Um, Tach, tachne, so la, nache, tache, tachne, three of them. So it's composed from the word three. All right, and so on. Okay, so those are independent pronouns, and, and I don't think this is all of them in the world. We just try to include a lot of them, you know, in, 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 from the language. Now, the dependent pronouns are completely, not completely different, they operate differently. So something that's independent means it can stand alone on its own in a sentence. Here I am, proud to be who I am. I can stand on my own, right? But a dependent pronoun has to be attached to a word or be a part of a word, okay? So if we go to page 117, you will see a list, hopefully, of verbal pronouns. Okay, on 117. Now we're back to this abstract looking chart. And they're all going to go, what the heck is all this noise, <laughs> right? But here we are, okay, on 117. Okay, so we already know that our verbs inflect which way? Internally, right? Not externally. And so these full pronouns, these independent pronouns, have been reduced to shorter shapes, okay? So she, which is I, now it's just shh, because it's going to get stuck inside of a verb. None, you, got reduced to a n or an m or an m. Okay, so you're either going to have n, m, or m, a nasal sound, right? Now, there is no, no verbal pronoun for him, he, or she, or it, zero, because it's the base verb. It's the simplest verb form is third singular, okay? All right, so first singular is who? Who is first singular in any speech, any part of speech? Let's go through these. First singular is me. Second singular is you. Third singular is he, she, it. And they're singular because it's only one me only one you and one he, she, or it. So this is first person singular, your second person singular to me, and she's third person singular to us and by herself. Okay, so that's what 1s, 2s, and 3s mean. Okay. This language also has duals. So what does duals mean? What would be a dual? Two, Two a pair. Okay, so we have, we have first dual, that's you and me, so it's you and I, right? So now it's not just me, it's you and me, right? So it's we two. Second duel, you two. So the difference if I say, you go chop wood, you two go chop wood, that's the difference, okay? All right? And I'm going to go chop wood. No, now we, you and I are going to go chop wood. Okay. And then third duel, which is really rare, is zero. Wait, am I doing independent? I'm doing independent pronouns, right? So this is sha, na, and it's in the book. So you got 
zero. Okay. And then there's first plural. So first singular means how many of me? One. So first of me and all of us is is so first plural is us. Us. We. See how it gets bigger and bigger? Second plural, you are by yourself. Now I'm talking to y'all. I'm talking to the whole classroom. So it's you all. Okay? And then third singular, which was just him or her or it, he, she, or it. Now third plural is they. They or them. Okay? So that's what those marks, those numbers mean on the side. Okay? First, second, and third, and then duals, and then plurals. Okay? All right. So when you're looking at the verb charts in this book, and online, when you look in the database in the future, you're going to see those on there. Now you'll know what they mean. So let's pick page 56 real quick. Just take a look at 50. Just grab a page 56. So let's say, let's go to um, the bottom of page 56, looking at something. So first singular, nestle, nestle. See, I'm, I'm looking at it. I'm examining it. Okay? Nestle. You're looking at it. Nesh, he or she's looking at it. So that's first and second and third singular. Okay? Now, neat, you and I are looking at it. Next one, you two are examining it. Okay? We're all looking at it. You all are looking at it. I'm talking to you as a group. I'm not included in that. You guys are looking at it. You're examining it. And then they over there, those people are looking at it. And the last one, the passive, is okay? And why is it called the passive? Because it's the unknown doer, the unknown subject. You don't know who's looking at it. Every night, someone comes and looks at my flowers. Who is it? <laughs> you know, man, they come every night and look at my flowers, and I can never figure out who it is. So that's the passive, because you don't know who the actual subject person is. So it's, it's in a, like it's, so it's in the passive voice. You know, you know, man, somebody cooks good bread every time I come here. It's so good. That's the passive. See, so that's what P means. So our our language has all nine of those in present tense, and has all nine of those in past tense. Because if I say, I'm looking, I'm examining, but I examined it, see the next one down? See? And it's, so this is, this is one of the GH perfective. Remember I told you there's an S perfective, an N perfective, and a GH perfective. This is, the, this is an example of a GH one. Okay? Um, so that's what those mean. Now, the dependent pronouns now are going to be shot inside of verbs, and that's going back to where we were on page 117, where we were. We'll try to find that again. On 117, you get to see all the, 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 uh, prona the, the dependent pronouns, because these don't stand alone in the language. I just can't walk in and go, shh. You'd be like, what is that? If I said, she, you'd, oh, you know, talking about myself. If I went to, mm, what? Oh, none. Oh, you. See, those are independent, but these have to be, they belong to something. They're, ob they're obligatorily inflected to something or, or a part of something. They have to be a part of something. And so that's how our verbs work. Um, and so that was the whole point of sharing this with you, is, is that the, independent, the dependent pronouns are a part of a verb usually. And they have different slots that they sit on the verb. Um, so I'll give you just a couple examples. Um, so let's kick somebody. Hey, no, let's kiss somebody. No, let's cook something. Um, what would be a good one? Let's, yeah, let's kick somebody. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> so, so tough means to kick, right? <laughs> All right. The verb root. This is the verb root, tough. And it's transitive. I mean, it requires an object, so that's why. And then I got yes. Yes, tush. He is kicking something, all right? 
So I can say here, let's keep adding on our sentence, that's the verb at the end. So I can say here, chesne, that's a man. Um, se, that's a rock. Chesne se yeltas. The man rock is kicking it. Okay? That's the SO that's the S O V. S O V. See S O V. Right? Subject, object, verb. Okay. What's fun about these, in de these dependent, uh, uh, dependent pronouns, now he's kicking me. Guess what happens? I get to swap out the object marker with a SH. It looks like this. Just ne shash So, just ne shash I am the object now of the verb. See, so here's your S. Here's the object. And here's the verb. See how truncated together, though? Now he's going to kick you. He's kicking you, so you go. Nastash. Just ne nastash, huh? That man's kicking you, huh? See? <laughs> by just by changing these out. So see how they're, they're just pieces of the bigger word? Sh and na? Yeah. And that's what changes it. And then, so again, these are dependent pronouns. And they're inflected onto the verb, typically. Usually on the verb, always. Not most, most of the time. So, in, so dependent pronouns versus independent pronouns, okay? And, and then nouns. So we have nouns, independent pronouns, and then dependent pronouns. And they operate like this. And now if I'm kicking, it's a different verb slot. Asht, tush. You're kicking. In, tush. He's kicking. Yes, tush. Okay? See where, the, see where the S goes here, and ush tush, in tush, it goes right there. The object slot's on the outside. If you look at the verb chart, the object slot's on the outside of the subject slot, and so on. So that's how, you, this is how, you know, so look at all the information that's in here. He just in shush tush. In English, you'll say, the man is kicking me. It's all in the verb here. What about those last two? Ush tush? What's this? Oh, I'm, I'm kicking. I kick, you kick, it. So, ashtash, inktash. So this is just me, like I kick, I kick rocks, you kick rocks, I'm being kicked. So, um, kick me, kick you. Kick it. So that's the object marker for third person. He's kicking it. Yes, tush. Shush, tush, nush, tush. She, ash, tush. Nun, in, tush. He, yes, tush. So anyway, I just want to shine, point out to you there's independent pronouns and there's dependent pronouns, and that's what they look like. And they're all over the language, and they're usually in verbs. 99%. I, we heard Global Sand recording one day. Don't uh, means already. I'm al already eight, I think it was. So no, he already kicked me or something like that. And I never heard it ever used like that. And that was really a rare, con you know, thing. But it was interesting. It was on a, it was on a, on an um, adverbial or something. Is that an adverbial? Anyway, but this is the way it's used most of the time. So those are our pronouns. Okay. And I know that that um, gets confusing if you're looking in the book and you don't even know what 1s, 2s, and all that means. You're talking about the, the pronouns in, in the verb. Okay. Hmm. All right. Well, we've got 20 minutes to five, right? Hump shuela mest hon. Or, yeah. All right. So we can go ahead and finish off this last piece. I already did part of it with you. And, I'll, and it's good. I know this is all the first time some of you have ever seen this. So the more you hear it, the better, right? I mean, it can only get better. And this is just the first passes. But it's all this stuff. Okay. Um, I wanted to talk to you about tense, all right? So what, is, what, are, what are the tenses again? Yep. So I'm going to start with present. 
and then we're going to go to past because that's the easy, and then we go to future. And I'm doing this just because this is the order they appear in the verbs. Okay. So, uh, page, page what here? Let me see here. All right, if you go back to page 114 now, they look similar to the other one, but it shows you the perfectives. You got, so you got the first person perfectives, I mean the S perfectives on 114, you got the N perfective examples, and you got the GH perfective examples. And so what I want you to notice is that we were using like S, right, for I, sh, right? And that's what it looks like in present tense. But in past tense, in the S perfective, it's an I, I, so SH turns to I. And it also does in the N perfective. All right, and it does over here too. So now, this is I in the past tense, this is I in the N past tense, and this is I in the GH past tense. This is in, in the center part of a verb. That's why these are very abstract, okay? Um, let's see, do I have some examples for us? I do. Okay, so let's go to, let's do this one. So the word is, is I see. I see the clock. I see you. I see the world. Okay, the the So what is, what do you think is, what, semantically, what does it mean to us? What's the, what's the meaning of e? To see, <laughs> exactly. Uh, very good, yes. And so the sh is who? Me, right? And then the the is, is just a thematic prefix, which means ongoingly, okay? All right, so that's the gush e. Now I saw it, so I'm going to write it over here. So it's ve si e. I saw it, okay? So gush e. See how the SH turned to an II here? <laughs> it doesn't, it's not, it's not, and then it gets the S, which is the perfective. You know, this is the S perfective, this is the N perfective, and this is the GH perfective, okay? And the next example, okay, so wash ush, wash ush. I'm giving it away, wash ush. I'm giving away knowledge, I'm giving away food, I'm giving away something that has a rounded shape or an abstract concept, wash ush. But I'm, I gave it away, it's wa ni on. Notice ush turns to on. So in past tense, two things are happening. I'm getting the change in the pronoun, I'm adding the perfective, and I'm also changing the languages, not me, from present tense to wash ush to wa ni on. So ush goes to on. That's called the oblaut. We have oblauts in English. Swim, swam. See, saw. Fly, flew. Does, did. Those are oblauts. So in the present tense, he did that, or he does that. And then the past tense, he did that. See, that's called an oblaut. It changes form. The bird flies, the bird flew. The man swims, the man swam. So we have many Dani too. So it goes from ush to on. So wash ush, I give it away uh, now. Wa ni on, I gave it away. And see how it changed an oblaut. So we have an oblaut going on in Talo as well. All right. Now let's go to the last example in the book here is uh, uh, Dust kirsch, so dust kirsch, kirsch. I mean, I'm shaving myself. Dust kirsch, your sh and all that going on. So we're going to go clear to the gh perfected this time, and we got the dust kirsch. So the oh, this one does it different. Ooh, okay. So this particular one keeps the sh. There's also verbs that go to digi as well, like this one. All right. So degush kirsch. But anyway, that probably isn't a really clear example, but that's okay. It's the way it is in the language. But anyway, uh, so I could think of some other words that have the ghii perfective for the past tense. But anyway, so so 
all the way across the language in the verbs, you're going to have verbs with an S or an N or a GH, and the pronouns change shape. Okay, and that's what this chart on page one fourteen is showing you. Okay, um, so for second person, it's seen. You know, um, for you and I, it's seat. For you two, it's su. And then for all of us, it's sagit and sagut for you all, and so on. And so that's what this chart is telling you. Again, it's very abstract, and it's meant to be abstract. It's just pulling out the core information and putting it into a chart. But again, you don't need to memorize all this stuff. I just want you to be aware how it exists in the language and how it functions. Okay? You will learn that just by using language. But this is, again, why grammar is what? Talking about language, speaking is for communication. Okay? So grammar studies tell us about the nuts and bolts the bones and skeletal structure of the language, but talking it is all about communication, expressing ideas, and sharing information. That's why, we, that's why we have human language, because we share with it, we communicate with it. That's the purpose of language, right? So this, again, is very abstract. And like I ended yesterday with that, too, is that remember, grammar is talking about the language. That's what grammar is. And it's fun to study it, because it helps you, what it helps us do when we're studying grammar and we get examples on the board, it helps us start to visualize the world of our language. You know, and it's, and it's good, and it should be done, and it's very important. But talking about the language is not speaking the language. They're two different things. And so our goal for the next two weeks after this is talking about how to start using the language and actually pronouncing it and saying it. You know, you know, using our phonemes, our sounds, using our structure, and you know, you'd be aware that somewhere in all this stuff makes sense, right? Because right now, maybe it's very confusing, and that's okay. It should be, because this, this, is, this is people's lifetimes of work, you know, to pull all this out of the language and get it into a booklet, you know what I mean? And um, that's why people are called grammarians. They study human language, and they describe it. So that's what these are. Grammarians make a grammar, okay? All right, so that's our past tense structure, um, also known as the perfective, because it's in a perfect state of movement. It has stopped moving. <laughs> it was moving, and then it went, <laughs> and is now perfective. There are some abstractions, too, that are fun. Um, we have, what we've noticed is that these types of perfectives are really different than they are in English, too. Like... Um, what we found out is, by studying the language, that words that have the S perfective can also still have the future marker on it, which is interesting. And let me explain. So if I say, I see, and I'm, I will see it, it's a right? So I see it, and now I will see it, right? And then I saw it, right? But what if, can I still put a te here? And what that means is, I will have seen it. That's how you get to that concept. I will have seen it. By the time that you get home, I have seen your F <laughs> on your report card. <laughs> yeah. So that's how you get to will have seen. You see what I'm saying? But guess what? We kind of found out that you don't really get to put up the future on the N perfectives as much and the GH perfectives because they're too far into the past. So what that tells us, this thing is called TAM, a time aspect modality, and there's a continuum of past tense. So the GH perfective is over here, only using up this much of past tense. The N is maybe here, using this much, and the S gets to use it all. <laughs> Meaning this, okay, like, okay, so if I say to you, I'm gonna go to town, what tense is that in? I'm going to town. Yes. Present tense. I'm heading to town. See you in an hour. Okay, right? So it's present something, right? And then there's one like, I went to town and there were no spuds. Went to the grocery store for nothing, right? So that's the past. So the same is kind of true with the espertalo. For example, if I'm going to town, it's te shush. Ta'aten ant te shush. I'm going to Crescent City. So, ob loud hap, so te shush, there's the I, there's the ush, there's the go, 
the oblat occurred. Te se ya, so ush turns to ya. And then na se ya, I went. So this is I'm going, I'm en route, I'm on my way, have not arrived yet, per se. And then I done went there and got back, or I finished my journey. So it actually has a, so across TAM, it, it covers a longer spectrum of past tense than this. Words like to sit, like you're doing, okay. So if I'm sitting down or ready, I'm already sat, right? I'm not sitting, I'm satted. <laughs> that's not even a word. I'm, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, but I'm trying to make a point. So, so, th so that's why it's da sa sta when you actually finally come to rest on your chair or table, it's da sa sta It's actually a past tense, right? But it's, it's a progressive past tense. Because how can I, now, right now I'm not standing, right? But when I, once I go like this, de sa sta S is a perfective. It's a past tense marker. But it made me no, go from sitting to standing. You see my point? That's why you can still put te on an S perfective. I will stand if you shut up. I'm making something up. Uh, so she de sus te te nun chu in de. No, I'll, I'll stand if you shut up. <laughs> I'm joking. But anyway, so, so that's so, so you're entering into that state of sittedness and the state of goingness. It's not over with really. Now, that's in these kind of verbs. But now if you take a, a verb like to go back to kick. So here's just tush. He's kicking right now. And if I say he kicked the ball, yes, tush. Is it tush or toss? I think it's tush. That's it. The, it. Actually, the kick is over. There's no in between. You know, like he's kicking the ball, and then he kicked the ball. So there's only two available in this verb, you see. But in go, look, you got three. Three ways of moving. So, so, so they, this time aspect modality thing, um, there's been linguists who have written on this. Um, that, so it's not as finite as we think in English. And so this one more, is more like English. He's kicking the ball, he kicked it. Where this is, he's going, he's on his way, he's en route, and he, he, he arrived. He's, he's done, he done went. <laughs> he went there, okay? So it's kind of fun. That, so the past tenses are not quite the same as they are in English, too. I mean, they're just a little different time frame than the universe, how they operate through time. And so, and this is one of the beauties of learning another language, is it helps us realize that we, our L1 language, our L1 language, which is our mother language, our first language, sets rules in our head because it's how we communicate. And then when we start learning a second language, this, this goes to work, hell no, that's, that's kind of weird. You can't talk like that, right? But eventually, if you give yourself a chance, you'll start understanding the worldview of the second language in comparison to your mother language, and your mind will shift. You'll start going, whoa, I didn't think the world operated like that. And yet, because you studied another language, that starts to bear its soul to you. And you study another language, and you go, wow, that language operates like this. This one operates like this. My mother language operates like that. And it makes your brain just expand of how the human language works. Uh, there's over th how many thousands of languages on Earth, you know, of all these languages that are completely unrelated. There's a, a language down in Central California called Wintu, and it's a member of the Penutian family. And I was taking a lecture on, uh, by a, a person named Cody Pata from Hawaii, and he's Wintu in Hawaiian. And he's, he's been studying Wintu grammar for a while. And so what blew my mind about the presentation, talked about how languages <laughs> work differently, is he said, so in English you say, the girl is sitting by the fire. So I close my eyes, okay, the girl is sitting by the fire, right? So I visualize maybe a fire ring, you know, and she's sitting there, okay? The girl's sitting by the fire. I'm done. But in the Wintu language, when you say in their language, there's these particles that get added on to the words. And so when you say in Wintu, the girl is sitting by the fire, it says that, but it tells you a bunch of more information. It tells you if the girl is sitting like cross-legged on her haunches or on her butt, first of all, just by adding particles on the verb. 
And, it, and so the girl is sitting by, the by tells you if the ground is flat, or if it's sloped, or if it's in a ravine. So what if your fire was in a little ravine, your fire was on the side of the hill, or your fire was on flat ground? So that date is in there. So the girl is sitting by the fire. Now I have a complete picture of the way she's sitting and the ground that she's sitting and then the other piece that tells you which way she's facing. Was she facing east, west, south, or, or you know, whatever. So all that is built by adding all these pieces that get thrown into the verb and onto the noun. It gives you directionals. It gives you all these uh, ways and modalities all in the world. So could you imagine speaking a language that gave you that much information on every sentence that you said? everything that you did, saw, thought, and, and you know, thought about. And so that's a completely another way to look at the world. Now, English, we don't think of it that way. Well, you know, it just doesn't work like that. Doesn't make it wrong, doesn't make it right. It just operates differently. So again, so studying different languages is very healthy for your consciousness, for your awareness, your worldview. And we're going to run into bias automatically because our L1 language rules. It has, it's the trump card. But it can learn to back off and go, oh, there's another way to look at the world. <laughs> you know what I mean? Really, I didn't know that about, you know, you know that's, that, that the world operates like that. So it actually expands who you are, gives you knowledge and understanding. So if, if anybody who has the luxury of knowing at least another language than their own, their brain is already like mechanically, you know, loosened up in a way, you know what I'm saying, to, to, uh, to, uh, to, to uh, absorb this information and knowledge. Because um, it's normal for us to have bias. If, uh, Y'all come back now to my, hear me, enjoy, to come and join me. What did your L1 just say to you? No, you just said, shut up, you don't talk right. Ain't no, no. <laughs> right? Is that what your L1 just said? Like, why is he talking like that? <laughs> because your L1 told you, <laughs> he's not from the West Coast, he's from someplace else, right? But that, you know, and that's just English to English, let alone if we're going to go from English to Daini or to Spanish or to Chinese or Japanese or whatever, or Yurok or whatever, you know. So there's so much wonderful stuff in learning another language. It just really is exciting and opens your eyes and, and lets you see things in a way that you never, like, three ways to go. And then, you know, and sometimes in a dictionary making, which I do almost daily, I always try to find the one-to-one -one English equivalent, you know. And I do, we do pretty good. And so I'll yell at Chahwantne, I'll yell at Scott if he's, you know, and say, hey, Scott, or Piawa, hey, or, you know, somebody in the office, how would you say this in English, you know, and does this sound right? And they're always probably wondering what's going through my head. But I'm trying to, so like for this one, for example, for Teseya, I finally found the word in root. And that one does it because he's in root to the store. You know, in other words, he's not there yet. He's not, you know, so he's in root. So that worked for that one. And this one here, go, worked pretty good for that one. And then this one here worked pretty good for that. So now, now look at these entries. Am I going to put these in the G area, in the E area, or the W area? <laughs> or am I going to put them in the Ya, Ush area for putting the dictionary together? <laughs> there, yeah, see, but that's exactly the dilemmas that we face and, and struggle, you know, I mean, to work out, right? So I'm saying, okay, so then we have to put it in the go area, <laughs> you know, and the in, in root area, and then, but who uses in root? Do you, do you use in root? He's in root there now. He'll be there tomorrow. <laughs> I mean, we know what it means, but do we say it on the West Coast? Not really, you know. So who's going to think? I want to know how to say in root. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Probably nobody. <laughs> <laughs> so would it be almost went or, or almost go <laughs> or something like you know what I mean or on the way go <laughs> yeah I mean anyway I'm being silly but that's the kind of stuff that you work on. Is there another way to say I'm on my way? Uh, yeah, on my way. Isn't that the same thing as in route? Yeah, way? I'm in route. That's oh, exactly. Uh, I'm our hump to shush. See, then you start adding these things that like so like take hump means about to, so hump. No, so hump te say yeah, I'm about to be there. Yeah, you wouldn't use hump here because I'm, uh, 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 I'm almost went. Maybe I almost went, maybe. <clears throat> but here I'm, I'm about to go. Ah, what was the question? Um, I'm on my way. She, she, to hump, I would go to this one, te shush. I'd use this one there. But, you know, on my way, 
on my, you know, on your text in the car, which is illegal, on my way. <laughs> I guess I would stay with Te Shesh for some reason instead of saying Te Seya. Just another question I was just thinking the word Shesh hum was about to. Hum, yeah. So the word comes to you when I was talking about the bias field. It is. Great. Exactly. Thank you for asking. So hum. <coughs> Hump chi de na ve. This is the whole word. So, hump chi de na ve tush. Hump chi de na wush tush. Chi hump de na rin tush. So, <clears throat> this means he. So, if you just take the verb part of the word, okay, so de na ve tush means you're picking up your burden, like your basket or your backpack, because in those days they used to walk, right, or canoe. So if I'm going to walk this Crescent City, I'm doing it like this, right? You know, I'm not getting in a car, you know, I'm, and so tush means to kick. We have yes tush, right? So de na ge tush, he is going to, within himself, kick it on down the road, right? You have to go over a hill, man, you got a burden on your back, 40 pounds, right? You're going to kick it up the sand dune or wherever you're going, right? So when you say about to, I suppose, I'm going to kick it on down the road. So over time, this gets taken away and is about to, I suppose, if you picked it clear down to his bones. So, so that's how he, that means goodbye, because it's like, Hump chi de na wush tush. I guess it's about to be, I suppose, I'm going to kick it on down the road. No, he's saying goodbye more than telling you to be adopted. Yep, that's what we're talking about. It's about, I'm about ready to kick that's it on. Hump chi. Yeah, and, and, and so off do, yeah, so, you, so we use both, right? Because you can use hump chi, and then that is off do. Mm, vash te. That's the whole sentence. So after un rush te. So right there we saw rush in means to see. We'll see, right? You're my object, you, n. So later on, you I will see. So instead of saying after un rush in te, it just turns into after. So in other words, you can use both of them. That yes, interchangeably. Yes. So later, you I see will. About to, I suppose kick it on down the road or the trail or whatever. And so these become borrowed out of the phrase to ahtu or to humpchi. And they're both legal. Another question I have for what's on my mind is what, what's the difference between hush and mm, why, why is it changed? Well, it's not changed. It's, it's expanded. Okay, good. Great questions. I love these questions. They're perfect. Um, so um, hush. Um, okay, so if I say... Um, or we say, but I'm saying so. Um, 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 hush. Um, it can be like it can also be like this too. Um, so hush by itself. Before there were any other races, so. So this is a black person, Negat Shun. So there were no Negat Shun, there were no Chanaman, uh, there were no Nachmintis, right? Nachminti is a white man, right? None of these other people existed except us. So all there were was we the humans. So hush means the human, right? And so if you say Chinaman people, Chinese people, you say Chanaman Hesha. And so what do we see earlier today? So you take the word hush, which is a human, right? And you add to it inalienability. No, uh, makes it possess p constantly because it's going to be possessed by the Chinese, the black person, or the Indian. Okay, so then that becomes she. All right. Okay. So, and we did Dani yesterday. Remember, we did done yesterday plus e equals de or excuse me, Dani. Right. 
So what is happening here is that hush means Indian, right? Hush kai utni. Huh? Looks like an Indian to me, you know, walking along the road. Hush kai utni. Looks like Indian there, okay? Also then, it also means Talawa, right? Because we're not talking about the Yurok, we're not talking about the Kus, we're not talking about the Kudruk, we're talking about ourselves, right? So there's Hush. So you can say the Hush Hayashet, the people, the Indian people of. You can say Negat Shun Hayashet, the black people, Janaman Hayashet, Japanese Hayashet, Natminti Hayashet. So that tells you that the word Hush means, really means human or a person like a human, the human race. And so does, so done meaning a location, right? Added with inalienability becomes deni. So really, in a way, they're somewhat equivalent to each other. Uh, but this one means more like a citizen of a, of a piece of ground. So if I'm at ha one quit done, then I'm a ha one quit deni. You see what I'm saying? So that's kind of, the, so this one's like a little more like, uh, like a citizen, I, I, I have citizenry in being a ta'at deni, a ha'wankwit deni, or a cheat deni from Brookings or whatever. So, that's, so they're really kind of interchangeable uh, in, a, in a big sense of the word. And then, of course, we, we look at what does hush mean, you know, semantically, it's a one syllable word. And the, the thing that we find right off is, for example, this is now down another rabbit hole, but yes, hush means to shoot. What, it, what was the man's job? To hunt. You had to shoot deer all the time, right? Or birds or rabbits or whatever. So maybe it's we are the shooters. It's a, it's a, it's a possibility. This is not a fact. This is, this is just a question to ask the language. What does hush mean literally? We know done means place, like ta at done, ha one quit done, yon talk it done. But hush, does it mean the shooters? So what are humans, we, we invented the bow. That's what made us, that's why we conquered the plains, because we invented the bow, the, the, the Diné people. Before that, they threw a thing called an adlas, right? It was a stick, on, you know, they threw it through a stick. And the new technology was the bow, the tatkash, right? The thing you pull, the tatkash. So tatkash is the bow, tatkash yashkash. So bow hunting. <laughs> You know, I mean, it, it's a posit, you know, I mean, we, I don't, you know, but we talk about that stuff, so is that really what, you know, underlyingly, we are the shooters, you know, um, and we defend, huh? Like the yeah, like the warrior, you know, we defend ourselves, we go, we get food with a bow, you know, and then tutkush means either bow and or gun, it means the same thing in our language, so it's just a posit, but that's kind of, oh, over here, where we get to the Dane question, and then the hush. And it's interesting because in Celeste, you know, the Tatutni side of our language, they kept Dene. They do not have Hush at all. So really, this is kind of interesting. Well, we haven't found it yet from all the recordings that they have and the, the written language. And so this might really be a Talo Chetko thing more than it would be maybe a Tatutni thing, possibly. I mean, it may pop up here yet, but I don't, right, Pio? I don't think we've seen Hush yet, I don't think. Because they're doing like a whole bunch of, they've got like hundreds of hours of recordings of their speakers, old speakers from the 60s and 40s and stuff, and we haven't found Hush yet. So that's kind of, so maybe that was something that was nuancing down here, but they do have the word Hush He, meaning a rich man. Hush He, Hush He you, they say, we say Hush Hai you for a rich man. So, hush, human, high, you, a man of high, a human of high status. Hush, high, you. Ha means upward, from the upper, upper stretches of, you know, uh, upper status of life. So, hush, high, you, they say hush, he, which is interesting. So, they do have that form of it that we've found so far. So, that is interesting. Um, but that's kind of the story about between, like, you know, uh, Hush and Heshe. So over time, once these other races appeared, you know, they got their names Negatshan, Chanaman, Natminti, Shpantyu is a Mexican or Spanish people, you know, Japanese or Japanese people. Uh, and then, so Hush then became more to mean Indian. You see, you see how that would happen? Because it's the comparison to the rest of the races coming into our homeland. You see what I'm saying? But if you're going to refer to those people, uh, like even the Karuk, we call the Karuk Chumne. And because it's describing them, they're Chumne Cheshet. 
But if your name comes from a piece of ground, like we um, Wei Yang, okay, so the Weots, so we got Wei Yang, we say Dei Ni, because Yang means the south. So from the south, people, see, so, so we don't call them Wei Yang, <coughs> We call them Wayant Deini because they're from a place called the South. Where these people is talking about uh, like, like their perspiration because it's hot in Kudu country. So, so it's describing an adjective. This is describing a piece of ground. Huh? Yeah, it could be like yep, uh, perspiring or sweating people. And then Dutmush is the same. So Dutmush is Yurok. You don't say Dutchmish Daini, you say Dutchmish Cheshet. Because this Dutchmish means people who swagger, like maybe when they walk or they dance, they swagger. That's what Dutchmish means. So it's not describing a location, it's describing an adjective. So it's Dutchmish Cheshet. But if you were at Tachit Dun, Rekwa, then it'd be Tachit Daini. If you're saying, where are you from? Tachit Daini. Tachit Daini. Nashli, I'm a Rekwa person because that's a piece of ground that you're talking about. So done has more to do with citizenry in the, in the location, where Hesha has to do with race or human. Yeah, so it's a neat story, actually. I mean, I, I, you know, so, so like even our first book, we call it the Hesh Weya, the, the Indian language. Because you know our word, we're not really Talawa, right? <laughs> right, that was borrowed from, or we got that from Yurok, right? Yeah, they call this that. That's the name for Jan Taket uh, in uh, Yurok. Talawa is, is Jan Taket. Yeah. Yeah, so when they say the Talawa, they're talking about the Jan Taket people, which is the center of our world. So, yeah, so the Talawa, the Talauk, or the Talawesh. There's three ways to say it because there's three dialects of Yurok. Talawa, Talawesh, and Talauk. And they all mean the same thing, but they're, if you're, you know, if you're Wichpec Yurok, if you're Pequan Yurok, or you're Rekwa Yurok, they have three different dialects of Yurok. Just like we had Crescent City dialect, Lake Earl dialect, and, and Yontaka dialect. I mean, they're all the same language, but there's three different dialects, and they're the same way. So that's, so that's kind of the, you know, it's, it's a complex story, but that's the story about Hush and Deini. So they're actually interchangeable in some ways. So like when I see that sign down at the mouth there, it says haun kut hush, I, I, I'd like them to say haun kut hayeshe, because it's, pers it's the engine from haun kut. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it shouldn't, should, well, it, it'd be better if it said haun kut hayeshe versus haun kut hush. You know, haun kut hush, yeah, it's just, it's not inflected the way it, it could be or should be, you know, with the, with the glottal stop, the E glottal stop, for example, as an example. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of the, the Hush and Daini story. And then, and, and then uh, yeah, Wayat Daini. So Hesti, so what is Hoopa engine? Let's look it up in here. Just because it, because Hesti means valley. Or oh, Hestai, oh, that's the people. So what is it? So what is Hoopa in here? Let's see. Just let's, let's run down our theory a little bit here. H I, is Hoopa in here? Did we even write them down? We must have. <laughs> Well, Hoopa Valley is Hesti, but the Hoopa Indians, hmm, where's Hoopa? Hoopa, Hestai Deini. Ooh, so we say Hestai Deini for them. So Hestai must, must mean a place. Hestai. Oh, where they're sitting. <laughs> da means to sit down, right? Hestai. Where they sat, people. <laughs> I guess I have to see. <laughs> Interesting. Well, they left us and whatever sat in that valley and never came back. <laughs> you missed that story yesterday. <laughs> yeah. All right. Great questions. Love it. Yeah. And so it's been a journey all the way around. Oh, I want to tell you one more story about Humpchi and Don't Off Do. Back when we were kids, we all learned Humpchi right off the bat, you know? And then other people start, you know, Auntie Ellen LaFountain, and then we say, off do, you know, and stuff like that. And so when you're around different elders, you know, like I told my Auntie Laura, my mom's oldest sister, I, when I was, one day I was leaving her house, I said, uh, Humpchi, Aunt Laura, you know, I said, Humpchi, and she goes, am I going to die? And I go, 
you know, like, like, whoa, 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 whoa <laughs> you know, back up here, you know, because I didn't, you know, wh wh I wouldn't want to say that to my auntie, like, oh, are you going to die, you know, and then, and she said, well, you say a hump cheek to somebody, like, when you're maybe going to see him for the last time, too, like, because you're going to take off on your journey, I guess, you know what I mean, and so it kind of had a different connotation about it, and so then I go, and so, then there's also this version, you know, the I'll see you later version, you know, versus I'm going to head off on my journey. And so I, I quit telling Auntie Humpchi because of that, and I started telling her off do because I definitely wanted to see her again, you know what I mean? You know, and so there was that little, like a little kind of a ed piece of education happening there for me that I wasn't quite, and I didn't want to, because when you're a kid, you don't want to offend your elders, right? I mean, you just like, they, they're like, you, whatever they kind of say, you tow to them, right? I mean, you know, whatever. And so that's kind of where I kind of started separating off a little bit. But then uh, you can hear other recordings of the people saying hump chi regularly you know um you know either one so i use them both you know uh too because there's not a reason not to and then i talked to some other family members and they thought hump chi this interpretation of leaving on your final journey from life was uh, too extreme like they said ah, i've heard that all my whole life and i'm good with it and i go well, that's i have too but it just she kind of made that difference um, it's just like Hawanti and Don Oyash is saying we have the same discussion because, you know, like, hello, right, Hawanti. That's another one you hear talked about. And then there's Don Oyash, which we talked about in here. No, da, no, yash. So growing up, the, when we first learned our first page of Indian words, you know, typed out, written out, was Humchi and Hawanti. Hello, goodbye, right? And so then one time they were having a shaker service over at Betty Green's house, and so all these people were gathering because somebody was sick, probably Aunt Betty or something, and they're going to pray for her. And so a bunch of us were already in the house, and so uh, Lila Moorhead, Daishri Lila, came walking in, and they used to come in, they used to always shake hands, you know, around the room with everybody as they come in. And so I told her, how want e? And she goes, I'm already in here. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's when I realized that these words are the same. So Hawanti does not mean hello. Like if I pick up my phone you know, and I go Hawanti, it would be wrong because you can't come in the room that way. Uh, so Hawant, we saw in that sentence earlier, just ne Hawant Nafta, the men are running along there. So Hawanti just means so there's somebody coming towards your door and you say Hawanti, be, be in the coming along, right? And so, da no yash, in here come, right? We had that on the board earlier, da no yash. So they mean this, they really are talking about how you are stepping from outside into a space. And so that's how we had to come up with, well, da la ha. Because a lot of people say, what's going on? Da e la ha is shortened to da la ha. So what's up? So when you pick up the phone now, you don't say ha want, you don't say da no yash, because it's ridiculous to think that they could come in the room through this thing. Their body cannot fit through this. The voice does, I guess. So you say, da la ha, what's up? But somebody's coming in your house or into a meeting or something, da noyash, ha want e. So as we learn the language, we learn more expressions that are more correct, you know, over time. You know, and that just takes elder correcting you. Well, I'm already in here. What are you telling me come in here? I'm already done, did pass through the doorway. I'm over here shaking hands with you already. You know, it's like I'm already at the party, you know, kind of thing. You know, so it's just, it's just learning and, and expanding, learning, expanding, learning, expanding, and keeping with it. And so you can figure out more and more and more and more, you know. And if you have any other questions like that, anybody, I'd love to, you know, share what we know, what I or we know about it to this point. Yeah. I did. Really? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So that's what you did when you were setting up in Oregon? Or well, you know? that, yeah, I went, when I went to Oregon, before I went to Oregon, I wrote this one before I left. I, I, before I left, I wrote this one. And then I learned the mistakes I made in this one for the writing system and turned it into that. Yeah. And now that form forward is what's on the database on all the computer stuff, you know, and all the, the 18, or I don't know if it's 18,000, pretty close to 18,000 entries at this point. Oh, that's very impressive. And like I shared yesterday, we're, t we're pulling it out of anything written that we can find, any recordings that we can find, we're dumping it in the language database. Just keep dumping it in there and dumping it in there and dumping it in there because we want it to grow and be as big as possible 
you know, we, we think today uh, we found a good word for smile. I brought it up yesterday, but Kyle's been listening to Amelia Brown, Daishri Amelia talk, and he asked her again today for uh, who, who smiles though? Who smiles though? In that case, it was he smiling. So, Shlagan may you sus. One, that guy, Shlagan may you sus. And then he, she said the other day, I smiled, it was, so, Gushlu awasus. So, I laugh and then I smile. So, so, you put two words together. And then there was one more form. Oh, they smile was, me he ye sus. Well, anyway, there's enough data now there to know that it's a GH perfective verb that I'm proposing because it's a, it's a you know, a wa turns into, that turns to wa, and then you got, uh, anyway. So I thought maybe tomorrow, if we could just clip out those recordings and play them for you, and then show you how then we backfill a verb paradigm from two or three words. Because we know enough of the structure of the language and the grammar now that if I hear just one or two forms of a verb, then you can build first, second, third, and fourth person, I mean, uh, plural persons. And if you hear one of the past tenses, you can just build it from that, just from one. It's just like grafting at that point. If it's a word we, d we didn't have. And, ki and smile is the one that I've been looking for for a long time. Because we'd ask people, how do you say smile? And they'd say, shri chan means to be happy. Well, then you smile, right? Or let lu, to laugh. And I'm going, so we say, okay, so semantically, to laugh means smile, or to be happy is to smile. But then here's Amelia saying it straight out. So, me you sus, and so that'd be me ush sus, me um sus, uh, and so on. I smile, you smile, and so forth and so on. You know, because we have the grammar rules all pretty much documented out now, pretty much. There's still stuff we've got to find out still. But it's been, anyway. So, so that's kind of how we backfill a verb. It's not creating new language. It's taking the language that exists, using the rules of the language, and then just filling in the blank. Because now we can, there's enough data to do that. You know, so it's not a new word at all, you know, and so on. So, yeah, it's just expanding it. So, any other questions that come up? If you think about something tonight or something else you want to discuss tomorrow, please uh, bring that to discussion. I'd love to, I'd love to share with you and at least what, I, what we've discovered and seen. Shu Shanila. Thank you.